This is a matchbook from a local store. As you can see, there's not much to it, and you probably wouldn't use it as a decoration. No, it's pretty much good for one thing, whether you like the classic approach, the safety first, away from the body, the tuck and cover, or flip, grip, and zip, or the busy mother technique, since you might have a child in the other arm. Not all matchbooks are blank, but the peak of their ability to reach consumers has long since fizzled out. For most of the 20th century, though, this little space had enormous promotional potential and became a top advertising tool in the U.S. and around the world. A pint-sized poster, designed not just to get the word out, but into your pockets and into your car, using a variety of colorful and eye-catching designs that ignited the imagination. One of the brightest lights in matchbook history was Henry C. Trout of the Diamond Match Company. In the 1890s, he improved the design by moving the striker to the outside and adding the phrase, close cover before striking, as an extra safety measure. When he pitched it to early clients like Duke Tobacco as an advertising tool, they ordered 30 million of them. Not long after, the Wrigley Company ordered a billion. That's a lot of chances to see a slogan or a logo, especially since we don't tend to throw them out before the matches are all used up. Vendors also found that giving them out for free actually increased sales, and thousands of companies followed suit, ordering matches by the trillion from makers like the Ohio Match Company, who put themselves on a matchbook, of course. It was a pervasive reflection of tastes, trends, and even technology, showing us how far we'd come in some ways, and how far we had yet to go in others. It's no coincidence that over half of American men smoked, first cigars, then cigarettes, and the national average for both men and women was around 40% for over six decades. Early lighters were difficult to use, or still a relative luxury, and even the portable ones had to be reflinted or refueled until disposable lighters changed all that in the 1970s. In the meantime, matches filled the gap for just about everybody. During the Depression, Hollywood and sports stars like William Powell and Dizzy Dean provided some warmth in this series from the Diamond Company, complete with career blurbs. They made a great campaign giveaway and commemorated places and events, whether it was on your local campus or a slightly larger affair. They offered advice and challenged our drawing skills. Do you have artistic talent? These are oversized matchbook greeting cards with corny jokes on the outside and on the matches. Best to set them on fire. There were matchbook jigsaw puzzles and dominoes games for the kids. No fire hazard, just punch out the pieces and have minutes of fun. Pinup girls got the matchbook treatment in the 1940s, boasting the work of top artists too numerous to show here, unfortunately. During World War II, Walt Disney sparked our spirits by creating insignias for different military units and releasing them in a special series. Others took a darker tone, like this one that says strike em dead, and had these crude caricatures of Japanese soldiers on the matches. Here's one with a bomb on each match, and the front says strike at the seat of trouble. That's because the striker is Hitler's backside, and you can hit it with little bombs all day just like it showed on the box. These books with the special matches are called features, and were trademarked by the Lion Match Company. The matches might have graphics individually or across the whole set. Now you may never want to use them all up.
Not surprisingly, restaurants took full advantage of features to show you their finest offerings. Not to mention the chefs and dedicated staff who make it all happen for you. It's books like these that remind us of the healthier reasons to light a match. And how about a beer with that meal? Or something stronger? After that, who knows what might happen? Especially in some towns. Features might be favored by filuminists or match collectors, but there are many different approaches. Some people have theirs on display, and some prefer to save space. You can shuck them or remove the matches for safer storage and to highlight large designs. And lucky ones might find some flats, which were never fully processed into matchbooks, and are uncreased, unstapled, and, well, unmatched. Some people might stick to favorite subjects, like boats or animals. Some people may have no system at all, and may have heard the call of matchboxes as well. The good news is that they still make matchbooks, and they look pretty much the same except for moving the striker to the reverse side in 1973, which is one way to date them, as they continue to make amusing appeals for our attention and shine a little light on our past.